I'm Carol Blue, and I'm a uh, research professor at the University of Houston, and at the same time, I'm uh, a uh, new media uh, producer and uh, the executive director of uh, the Dawn Project, a nonprofit that uses new media for community development. And uh, I've always worked in teams uh, to get things done. And uh, about April of this year, I heard about a grant with the National Endowment for the Arts that recommended teams working together, artists, architects, city planners, all working together to uh, do art that's going to eventually end up being something that will um, vitalize a community. So I applied, and uh, it was 457 cities in the United States that applied, and Houston was one of 51 that got accepted. And so I kind of knew I was onto something, and then I found out that uh, Houston Arts Alliance was also having a grant for something called, I think it's Creative Economy, you're gonna to have to correct me about uh, that. And it was the same kind of combination. And uh, then later on, I don't know whether you guys have heard of Art Place, but Art Place is a national uh, movement by National Endowment for the Arts and about 10 to 12 other major foundations, Ford Foundation, Knight Foundation, um, Rockefeller Foundation, and it's doing the same thing. So I said, oh my goodness, this is some kind of uh, trend that's bubbling up here on a local level and a national level. And so I thought it would be a really good idea if Houston began to have dialogue around these con uh, concepts that are beginning to happen. And so I invited uh, Jonathan Gus and Maurice Cox to come in and um, talk about both creative placemaking, which comes out of National Endowment for the Arts, and uh, creative economy, which comes out of the Houston Arts Alliance. I keep thinking I'm making a mistake so <laughs> but it's, uh, And uh, I decided that it would be great to have a team, uh, a team of an architect, which is Terry Smith, a business manager of systems, <laughs> which is Jason, um, McLemore and an artist uh, who's also a community activist, which is Rick Lowe. And uh, the way that I saw this going this afternoon is that it should be a dialogue rather than a panelist talking at you, but everybody talking with each other. So what I'd like to do before we get started with the panel is I'd like to go around the room and have everybody here say who they are and uh, you know where they're coming from in terms of what they do in relationship to why you came to this panel. I'll start here. Uh, I'm Filo Castore, I'm an architect. I came from Italy 15 years ago, and uh, I love Houston, I never went back. And uh, I've been involved with the arts since I arrived here, and uh, get my sanity, and uh, a quality of life. And I'm here because I'm interested in the topic and see how arts is a player in Houston here. My name is Esmeralda Tangley. I'm law professor at Texas Southern University at the law school. I'm also on the board of the Greater Southeast Management District, and I'm doing a lot of research that's interdisciplinary in nature, in law, urban planning, architecture, so this is very helpful. And I'm also a native Houstonian. How you doing, Cedric? Uh, active in the architecture and arts community here in Houston. I'm Val Glitch, I'm an architect in Houston and very interested in the arts. I'm Ann Shaw, I'm with the Center for Houston's Future, but my background, and, and it, at the Center for Houston's Future, we're doing scenario planning and uh, community indicators work, um, but my background is, is uh, co-founder and first director of Houston Center for Contemporary Crafts, so I know how craft has changed you know, creative economies around the country. I'm Roberta Burroughs. I'm an urban planning consultant based here in Houston, native Houstonian, very intrigued with the role that art can play in community revitalization because that's my thing. Hi, I'm uh, Bruce Kringhouse. I'm a community activist in southwest Houston. I'm president of a volunteer organization there, and I 
attended a meeting that Jonathan was at with Councilman Ann Clutterbuck a while back to try to see if we couldn't do some unique stuff on some of the new bridges on Braze Bayou. I'm also active in trying to make Willow Waterhole one of the neat parks in Houston, which is in a very low income area and is surrounded by low income apartments. But it's a beautiful park with a lot of wildlife and uh, lakes there, and I think it could really benefit from the arts. I'm Lisa Johnson. I'm with the General Services Department, and my team manages the park's capital improvement program. And my background's landscape architecture, and I've always loved the arts. I'm Cheryl Parker. I'm with Project Row Houses, and I'm the Executive Director of Row House Community Development Corporation. Hi, my name is Lisa Davis. I'm a landscape architect. I'm with the Office of James Burnett. I recently attended a talk um, by Morris Talk at the ASLA conference. I'm Grace Rodriguez. I uh, work for DFJ Mercury. It's a venture capital fund, but I also co-own a creative agency called Culture Pilot. We host TEDx Houston, and we're actually doing TEDx Women um, in a couple weeks. Um, and I'm a co-founder of C2 Creative, which is um, Houston's first creative accelerator based on the Y Combinator accelerator, kind of um, helping creative uh, professionals start their own businesses and ventures. Um, my name is Michelle Scurry. I'm currently a sustainability specialist with the background in architecture and urban planning. My name is Latania Stevenson. I'm currently a facilities manager for the state of Texas, Department of Health and Human Services, and I'm um, a member of NOMA National Organization for Minority Architects. Hi, I'm Timothy Mose, um, secretary for the Houston chapter of NOMA, um, and also project manager for Gizler Architects here in Houston. Uh, and I guess my presence is to hopefully assist in widening the network of folks from the engineering architectural community uh, assisting Carol in that and uh, other technological organizations that we uh, pretty much deal with every day. Thanks. I'm uh, Steve Spillett. Uh, I'm a consultant here in Houston, uh, urban development strategy, and I'm working with Carol uh, on the Our Town Southeast Houston process, which is just getting underway and is all about creative place making. So I think this is going to be a fantastic, uh, we're just getting started, so this is just a fantastic kickoff, and I'm really glad you all are here. My name is Anderson Stout, Capital Projects Manager, OST Alameda Corridors Redevelopment Authority. That's TERS number seven. And um, we're just interested in having art um, within our boundaries. And uh, we welcome any art um, um, that can come into the community to kind of help uplift uh, and bring up the, the entire um, look of the community. So we look forward to any place making creative art, um, things of that nature within our boundaries. Um, I'm Sarah Kellner. I'm the project manager for the um, Arts and Transit program for the Houston Light Rail expansion. And I also do uh, fundraising for small and mid-sized nonprofits. I'm KJ Oscar, I'm a landscape architect, and I do believe that uh, great cities has arts everywhere. And, uh, and uh, Houston certainly be one of the greatest city in the world with, with the arts everywhere. That's, that's certainly my vision. Hi, my name is Ochi. You can always tell a student in the room because we stand up when we talk. Uh, I am a student of Texas Southern University with a double major in art and communications with a specialty in radio, TV, and film. I am a filmmaker, uh, documentaries. I'm an activist, and I also am a music producer. I'm Chris Bender. I'm the uh, Director of Information Technology and New Media at the Houston Advanced Research Center. I've been working with Carol on uh, her project and uh, attending various meetings and coming up with ideas and support for uh, internet and new media in uh, some of these uh, community programs. Good evening, I'm Preston Rowe. I'm the Super Neighborhood President for Super Neighborhood number 68 and I'm glad to see Val here. Uh, I'm always interested in getting redevelopment into the area. Val has designed a project that is coming into the area, the 
4415 Perry Street Apartments, which is due for completion in November of next year. Also, we have the Greater Southeast Rail Line that is coming into the area. My area covers uh, from uh, 288 to Makawa and from OST down to the South Loop, which has 11 civic clubs. So we're interested in getting that area redeveloped. I've been in that area for 47 years. I've seen it up and I've seen it down. So it is now coming back up. Thank you very much. I'm Catherine Straw. I'm uh, a new fundraiser with the University of Houston. I have a background in the arts, and so I'm going to be working with um, hopefully supporting Carol and her project. Hello, my name is Ron Stilmarski. I'm a, an architect who's fairly new to the region, and I'm really sort of trying to find all the outlets for, for the arts as well as for the transformation and the, the ability for arts to transform. And I think the public realm is a piece of uh, the, the wider puzzle that we all contend with, and so I'm looking forward to you know, hearing what the group has to say. I'm Terry Smith, president of Smith & Company Architects. Um, our firm does mostly cultural and community related projects. So Carol's asked me to attend and I'm happy to be here. Hi, I'm Jonathan Gless. I'm the CEO of the Houston Arts Alliance. Welcome to um, Alliance Gallery. And uh, I look forward to speaking with in a few minutes. Uh, my name is Jason McLemore. I'm the executive director of the Greater Southeast Management District. Uh, Carol came with us with this wonderful idea uh, about technology in the park at Palm Center, and that's how I got introduced to this program, and so I'm really looking forward to moving forward. Um, hi, I'm Maurice Cox. I'm a professor of architecture at the University of Virginia uh, and the former mayor of uh, the city uh, that prides itself as an arts city, uh, Charlottesville, Virginia and the uh, former director um, of design at the National Endowment for the Arts. And we piloted um, the program that became our town uh, during my tenure there. Well, tonight, all I guess I should say is that I'm a friend of Maurice. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Rick Lowe. I'm the founder of Project Row Houses. <laughs> Hi, Santera Dresch, Civic Art and Design Coordinator for Houston Arts Alliance. Welcome. Okay, Maurice, can you start, please? Sure, yes, go, go right into it. Um, uh, thank you, Carol, for um, inviting me and for um, putting in a really fascinating proposal to the National Endowment uh, and surrounding yourself with a pretty extraordinary team. Uh, gives me a lot of encouragement that you all are gonna be successful uh, in, in your pursuit of this. Um, I was asked to try to draw from some of my experience local, uh, locally uh, as uh, an elected leader and as a designer working in the public realm um, to try to, to engage citizens um, again in public places. Uh, and I think um, that fact, uh, the, the whole notion that um, I say, how do you, how do we engage people again in public life? <laughs> I think you will see from the examples um, that it's as much about uh, uh, art as it is about finding ways that um, uh, art inspires people to be involved in their environment, not uh, passively looking at something beautiful, but actually interacting with art. Um, so I, um, I've listed nine things would just keep me organized and I'll try to go through them quickly um, that I found are successful in um, advocating for creative placemaking. Um, one is if you are willing to give the work uh, back to the people that you are asking to be engaged uh, and that you are willing to pace the work at a rate that they're able to receive it. Uh, which I think is incredibly important. Uh, many communities try to rush through, independent of where, where their community starts from. And then I think that that uh, ability um, allows the community to essentially make courageous decisions. Um, so often we are confronted with this issue, you know, uh, that inevitably we're asking people to accept change. And uh, I remember uh, being at a community meeting and. 
uh, this woman um, who's an old timer in our neighborhood said, you know, sure, I, I'll change. Yeah, everybody wants change, right? You know, uh, as long as you don't screw up the way things are now. <laughs> so there's a, a fundamental contradiction, right? Uh, she doesn't want you to screw up what's happening now, but yet you are asking them to make uh, a big change. So many politicians just ask, well, why bother? This is going to shut down any innovation, any creativity. Why do we even bother to engage people? Well, I'd like to think that it uh, is for a very specific reason. Um, because the participation that citizens have in the decision making essentially builds their capacity to accept the change. Uh, that's all we're doing is we're uh, adjust, we're allowing them to accept and understand the nature of change, or in many cases, whether they can even recognize that change is needed. Uh, that engagement helps them to understand that things are not okay just the way they are. So the challenge is, you know, what are the ways that we can um, bring people uh, into this question? And I found, I've spent many a lonely city council meeting uh, with a public hearing uh, with one person showing up or uh, so disheartened and so hardened in their opinion that there was no way that they were there to learn anything new. Uh, and so I found that the more venues we create outside of City Hall um, so that uh, ordinary citizens can learn and engage in new, uh, new things, uh, the better, the better we, are, we are as a community. And this is often through community design centers, charrettes, workshops, uh, convenings like you're holding today, where the process of change and the creative process of making is uh, made transparent, uh, where citizens literally see how the process of uh, creating uh, a place is made. And then uh, it involves you know, workshops, it involves seminars, it involves exhibitions, it involves uh, people uh, understanding uh, the nature of uh, the creative process. Uh, critical piece, uh, and there's really not a lot of places in most communities to do this activity. Um, but also, that, you might say that's the bottom up to put pressure. Um, for change and innovation, but I think if you allow your elected leaders um, to be visionary and think long term, um, I think they too will uh, take bold action. And that is knowing that their citizens are willing uh, to stand with them and support it. Politicians aren't by nature courageous. <laughs> they get their courage from us. Uh, and, our, and their knowledge that we will allow them to go out on a limb and speak something visionary and think uh, beyond their own term. Uh, so for about three years, I um, conducted this Mayor's Institute on City Design, and some of you may have uh, heard about it because your own Mayor Parker uh, attended uh, a Mayor's Institute. And this is really where um, the mayors are surrounded for two and a half days with some of the leading um, design thinkers across disciplines, urban planning, architecture, transportation, real estate development, uh, artists, and, uh, and architects. And they huddle where the mayor brings a particularly challenging project to, um, to the designers. And instead of having their planning director by their side presenting it, they're presenting it. And they have to learn over the course of those days the language of design, how to speak about their uh, desire for a quality of life in their city in terms that are design terms. Um, you know, they learn about uh, the power of the grid of their city, uh, about how neighborhoods might be formed, about the mixes of uses, about the role uh, of design, and they just, they soak this information up like a sponge. Uh, and I think this is the beginning uh, of uh, a certain degree of um, courage on the part of these leaders. And so one example is uh, former Mayor uh, Mandy Diaz of Miami, who in a city um, you know, much uh, like Houston, sprawling, he decided that he wanted to create a mixed-use city. He wanted to completely throw out <laughs> the old rules of how this city was formed to create a mixed-use zoning ordinance. And it involved, again, the necessary process of engaging 
the community. It passed. It took three years, uh, but he got this through. Or the idea that our elected leaders continue to need um, assistance, technical assistance, uh, teams that come after the fact and the learning continues. So not only do you send a Mayor Parker to the Mayor's Institute, but when uh, she gets back, there's a support, a professional community that is there to support her and try to unravel and bring others along. And we did uh, dozens of these technical assistant teams after the fact. Um, thirdly, if you lead with the public investment in the public realm, uh, then the private dollars will follow. So I believe that uh, a city um, determines um, where and how they want private investment to happen um, by placing, placing the public dollar um, in a place where the private sector can see it. And I'll just use this case uh, at my uh, hometown in Charlottesville where um, as a result of public policy that said the arts was going to be a, a corridor, a, a district, a pedestrian district, um, and that um, we would aggregate the arts so that they fed off of each other. So we saw the emergence of a, of a nonprofit, three nonprofits in this um, metal cladded building um, for, for community arts or the conversion of a historic movie theater into a performance space. You can walk one block over and you'll go to the Paramount uh, Theater, another historic movie theater that's been converted to a performing uh, arts um, center. And so the, what's interesting about this is the public investment, uh, for, apart from a whole series of tax um, abatements, the, none of these facilities built one single parking spot. Uh, because the parking structure, which is just one block um, south of these establishments, was financed uh, by the public. So effectively, it enabled these um, arts organizations to build without the expense of parking. Uh, and then finally, at the very end, um, an outdoor venue, uh, outdoor but covered, uh, 3,500 3, seats. Uh, under a, an outdoor amphitheater as the last public-private uh, partnership um, for uh, outdoor concerts. Um, I always think, and I guess this resonates with your state, if you don't like the rules of the game, then you change them. Um, inevitably, we find that uh, the community that we want is not often the community that is legally uh, allowable. <laughs> so. So if that is the case, I think a uh, community has an obligation uh, to engage the kind of cross-section of, of, um, of thinkers to really rethink those rules. So in our case, you know, uh, strip commercial streets were, were the, the part of this community that people loved the least. And so we went in and we completely undid it to make that uh, less desirable, uh, the image of the strip commercial, and the uh, mixed use, retail, and uh, residential um, allowable by right. Uh, and so we've started to see that kind of change happening through typical neighborhoods. Well, a lot of that's about downtown cores, which I think do represent uh, the collective identity. But you know, the heart and the unique quality of our cities are found in their neighborhoods. So inevitably, you know, we have to move to the places where people live and uh, once again try to find ways to decode uh, the, 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 their neighborhoods and how people move and issues of how, how people actually communicate. So is it possible to invent new tools um, that allow people to express their desires, whatever their va values might be within their own neighborhood? And this led to um, a series of main streets uh, in um, neighborhoods that were traditionally traditionally see, received very little city attention um, that um, were filled up and led to a kind of transformation from auto-centered streets to ones that integrated the pedestrian. Uh, and then even the public investments that were made in the public realm became a catalyst for um, new housing models. Uh, like this mixed-use affordable housing uh, and retail block. 
as a result of the kind of public investment first in the public realm, uh, these types of projects then followed. Uh, six, if you make place uh, for designers in civic life, uh, then you'll raise the level of discourse uh, in the public realm. Um, and I've, uh, I believe quite strongly that um, as designers, if we're able to get beyond the association in the public's mind of us as stylers of simply exquisite objects, and the public begins to think of designers as creative problem solvers, then our capital and our value uh, goes way up. Uh, and the question is, how do you do that? I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you volunteer? Um, or um, how do you bring your expertise? I, I, I love this example of uh, San, San Francisco Federal Building by Thomas Maine. It's in the um, Mission District. And the idea that this piece of architecture, one, would uh, happen in uh, a preservation district um, has everything to do with who did the choosing. Um, it turns out that Robert Campbell, uh, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, architecture critic, was uh, chairing the committee that chose the architect. So they, this notion that you would actually get experts in the field to help, um, to help uh, choose uh, public commissions, I think is a critical uh, way that designers can uh, bring their talents to um, to um, the collective. So how does that play itself out in um, the community in which we live or the community I live in? Um, we basically began to see the role of designers on our planning commission. So we went from having one of nine members uh, uh, on our planning commission be uh, designers to six of the nine being um, people within the design profession, um, ad hoc task force for all kinds of special projects, as well as uh, design review boards and districts. So what happens when you get someone who produces uh, international, in international quality architecture like this uh, on your review boards? Well, you, it produces uh, a whole um, support system for designers doing their best work. So at one point there were over 24 designers appointed to boards and commissions um, throughout the city and it went from planners to landscape architects to urban designers to preservationists. And we watched the radical transformation of the conversation about design and the quality of design happening throughout our city in a matter of months. And so if ever we're, we're looking for a way where we can make uh, a difference, I think it's through, quite frankly, infiltrating uh, these places where decisions are, are made. Um, and then what happens, you know, we end up getting uh, a very different kind of architecture. This is a transit center, uh, visitor center cafe uh, in, uh, in Charlottesville designed by um, Wallace Robbie Todd. Again, the, the whole notion about what design could be as a part of making these places uh, changed. And even in a community as conservative um, and in love with Thomas Jefferson and Columns as <laughs> Charlottesville is. Um, but I think the other part is that transit is the, the spine on the which we are able to legitimately talk about placemaking. And uh, we don't think of transit as simply a place to get you from A to Z. What it really is is an excuse to make a place uh, that will engage people f on, the f on foot uh, and surround them with things that would interest them. Uh, that's what's happening at the street level, and that's what's happening above as you mix residential. So it's your transit, in my mind, is the ultimate excuse to start to create places, very discrete places, and at each one of those um, points. Um, seventh, if you um, hold design competitions, I think, to explore the challenging issues in your city, then you also engender a culture, I think, that will demand design excellence. So it, you, you, you reserve these for challenging issues, and uh, you uh, engage the public in them, 
and you watch the level of support and demand for design skyrocket. And uh, so in Charlottesville, you know, in this particular case, the, the challenge was uh, an old trailer park um, development uh, and how to redevelop a trailer park that might actually have different incomes and different ways in which people can move up through affordable housing. So, you know, you go from a trailer park being evicted for, for valuable land to us thinking about how can we maximize the density um, in that development. Or uh, the city market. And these are competitions that are there to stimulate public debate. There's no you know, imminent threat, um, but this is a way to get and keep placemaking in the forefront of the public's mind. Um, or you know, the idea of doing, if you're doing a park, uh, how about um, engaging the clients of the park, uh, the very kids uh, who use it as, a, as, a, as an opportunity to teach the power of design at a very early age. Um, nationally, uh, as I went to the NEA, uh, there is a whole series of competitions that are used um, to support uh, nonprofits that are doing fantastic things, like the Children's Pittsburgh Museum, that not only cared about their facility, their primary facility, but also about what their entrances were. So these are these uh, unsightly uh, railroad passes uh, that they held. Um, uh, a limited competition for to get ideas from um, from uh, artists to transform them, and so these are digital light uh, light shows. Um, but the other thing that I think is important is they understood that to, to be successful, they had to form collaborations across the city and try to work with um, the variety of arts related organizations to reanimate public space. So uh, this is one, um, one example of that outcome. Another is simply giving small grants to community organizations to engage the public again in a discussion about the public realm. So uh, what was interesting to them is, well, they noticed that not many young people were going to the farmer's market. <laughs> and so they uh, gave a grant to a youth organization to um, create a place for young people in the farmer's market. Or um, that whole notion of getting in touch with nature and the idea of nature walks as a way of, again, getting young people familiar with uh, the simple you know, leisure activity of walking um, through uh, or biking through or marking their place with these uh, chalk um, demonstrations in a place. So, it, is, it suggests that um, many folks, uh, particularly young people who don't have a traditional sense of how public space, what public space is for, um, to use these opportunities to program uh, spontaneous events that um, teach them again the nature of public space or the history uh, that might um, be revealed if they spoke and talked to a senior. So I think this is, it sounds like it's an, a, a rather an extension of what a, a museum might do, but it's critical and it's all happening not inside their building, but outside in the public realm. Uh, example that I supported at the NEA, which I, I love, is uh, Tyree, Ty, uh, Tyree Guyton, who is uh, the artist of the Heidelberg Project, uh, an extraordinary two-block stretch of houses, many of them abandoned, that this artist took over and uh, did um, um, art, street art, uh, and married that artist with uh, the Detroit Design Collaborative uh, led by Dan Patera, an architect, that tries to use the burnt out houses of Detroit as an opportunity for gathering, to draw attention to the blight by engaging artists to transform them. And these became moments um, of gathering and celebration. Uh, and, uh, and then in the end, the collaboration um, on, at the Heidelberg Project of taking one of these abandoned buildings opening it up and creating an outdoor theater that um, allows for public performances to happen uh, within the neighborhood. Eighth, um, 
If you use public art, I think, to delight and provoke thought, then citizens will engage in public, uh, public life again. And so I want to talk a little bit about the community chalkboard in uh, Charlottesville, which was commissioned during uh, my administration on council by a landscape architect and architect, um, Pete O'Shea and Rob Winstead. And that pedestrian mall that had all of the theaters that you saw on it, this is what it normally looks like on a, on a Friday afternoon. Um, but at the very end, towards the city hall, this is what it looks like. It kind of dies. It dies into a series of streets um, and traffic islands. And what we uh, thought is, <clears throat> Let's have a competition, and the competition center was around the idea of free speech uh, and a monument to free speech. And this uh, is the one, this is the entry that won. It was an 80 fo 85 foot long, 8 foot tall ch chalkboard with a tray of chalk uh, across the street from City Hall. Uh, and the public was invited to pick up a piece of chalk <laughs> and simply speak their mind, uncensored. Uh, and what was interesting about this is um, it's, on, uh, it's on a sidewalk in front of a street and there's City Hall. Well, I can't tell you the uproar uh, that this caused. Um, it was, uh, People said, you know, we were pushing the envelope to actually ask people uh, to what they really uh, thought. Uh, and uh, people assumed that it would be a graffiti board, that it would uh, profanity, uh, people, there would be slanderous things written on it. And uh, it actually was a pretty scary and yet fascinating exercise in how much, um, how, how much we trust our fellow citizens with free speech. Um, well, the important thing I think here was not a, a chalkboard along a sidewalk along a street, but to try to use that as an opportunity to aggregate other activities that were, were latent, they were there, like this outdoor amphitheater that I uh, showed became um, a, a fixed um, covered amphitheater. Or um, juxtaposing transit and uh, the, juxtaposing transit and the amphitheater and public art to create a vibrant uh, place. So going from a chalkboard along a sidewalk to a chalkboard in a public plaza with thousands of people on foot um, next to an amphitheater that had no, park, no additional parking uh, built uh, because people were able to use the, the transit hub as a way um, to go. And then here you can just see the placement of this chalkboard um, that talks about the use of art as something as a centerpiece, but inevitably interactive. And so um, we found that it is self-policing uh, because uh, hundreds of people walk by it constantly. Uh, it's washed down about three times a week uh, and so it's very ephemeral in that way. But it also has become a legitimate place where people protest, uh, where people make announcement, political announcements, and people make um, personal statements. Um, people confess uh, issues that they're working with, uh, like their health. Um, so that was something that surprised us, but it also is a place occasionally of beauty. Um, and not just for uh, professional artists, uh, but also uh, from kids who legitimately feel they have a place in the public realm uh, to express themselves. And uh, this, this phenomena about how kids reacted to this really uh, caught our attention. And uh, I wanna just quickly show you a series of programmed uh, events um, to create uh, murals on that wall. It's a collaboration between our, our, our Arts Council and The Bridge, which is uh, an organization of artists. And uh, they hold a very uh, weak camp where, uh, with middle schoolers who take on a theme, like the theme of your neighborhood. Uh, so they're literally walking out throughout their neighborhoods, collecting stories, observations, and then they come back to the wall 
and they create a temporary mural um, explaining, expressing their concepts of what their neighborhoods are. And it's, um, it's, a, it's an incredible uh, thing to observe. Uh, young people encouraged to write on walls uh, and to express themselves and to learn something not just about the place where um, uh, the chalkboard, but also um, the stories of change, where in this case, um, how do you get young people to understand the power of change? So looking at the history, uh, the local history, and um, beginning to try to talk about what was gained, what was lost with the changes that were made to their neighborhoods, um, the African American school, and talking to some of the storytellers uh, to understand the role of urban renewal uh, during their life, and then coming back and talking about physically um, how their neighborhood changed over time. So this, so this whole notion that uh, even young people uh, can begin to understand the power of changes made in the urban environment and that those changes would be for the better. Or this last one, this past summer uh, with the watershed, there was a big issue about um, water management and the building of a dam. And so this time the walk uh, was through the woods. It was in nature. And the students came back, the kids came back, and began to translate what they saw. And their, their final result. Uh, now again, this is up for three, four days, and then it disappears. Um, but I think the, the point here is that the art is not perceived as something static that you look at that beautifies, but it's actually a place that allows you to make some expression about the community you live in. Uh, and uh, lastly, I want to talk about this issue of designing, uh, this time according to the values, the community's values. The First, first Amendment was a value very, very dear to the Charlottesville community, and it spawned a very unique expression uh, of art. Uh, but I think when you design according to community's values, you basically strengthen their capacity to problem solve, and they will inevitably take very, very bold, bold action. Um, this one is a little closer to home. Some of you may know this project. It's called the Splash Pad Park. It's by uh, Walter Hood, um, a landscape architect in Oakland. Uh, and this park that you see is, was community driven, it was community created, and it's community managed now. Uh, but it started out like this. It started out as a traffic island along an elevated highway, uh, a no man's land. And as a result of uh, the threat that that site would be developed, um, if you see now that park is actually the last exit or last in, uh, entrance to that body of water that this neighborhood had. So they were fiercely protective of it. But their response wasn't simply to stop something bad from happening, but was to transform it into a place um, that they could own and that they could use. Um, and how they thought programmatically uh, the place should be made. Um, as you can see, there's an ample amount of, of hardscape there. It's because their idea is that this is a place where markets are held, where festivals are held. And so you come to this place on a, a Saturday morning, and it is overrun with the community's expression of gathering there. Um, musicians, um, traditional farmers market activity, kids. Uh, and uh, they, they program it themselves, some salsa lessons uh, to um, uh, dining outdoors. And what's been fascinating about this park um, is that the buildings around the park have all been reclaimed and have been rehabbed as a result of this community determining that this traffic island would be a place. Um, and I think this is the best 
uh, form of, of uh, placemaking uh, that's driven by a community's desire uh, to take ownership of it and to turn it into a thing of beauty. And then interestingly, um, the name, the splash pad, uh, that was given um, to the park by kids who um, yeah, loved <laughs> this fountain, this water feature that wasn't exactly supposed to be a swimming pool, uh, but became one, and it became known um, as the Splash Pad Park. So I think that uh, design is uh, really everything in this instance, and uh, I think the quality of public space um, has got to be, be made a public issue, and I think this is the kind of forum in which we can talk about that. So, thank you. When Carol asked me to participate in, in the conversation, she asked me to talk specifically about HAA and the programs that we have here that respond to the ideas of not just public art, but also placemaking. And we've actually had some change over the last few years in the way that we've been, been approaching this. But I thought that it might be, for this group of people in this room, because of the focus over the next few days, but also because most of you are Houstonians, I, I thought it might be helpful to step back and spend a few, a few minutes and look at a document that was created in the 1990s uh, called the Houston Framework. And uh, our friend Rick Lowe was heavily involved in the creation of that document. and. Uh, Rick, please feel free to step in at any time and, and uh, add comments. But um, essentially, the H excuse me, Houston was late to nationally to getting to a place of talking about um, establishing public policy around public art, public design, uh, architecture preservation, et cetera. One of the real critical steps in moving that conversation forward was in fact this 1997 document called Houston Framework uh, that had really an impressive group of citizen, citizen leaders involved in establishing it. Um, it was led by a woman by the name of Jessica Kusick, who's Santa Monica based now, and some of you might mean, remember Jessica. She's really an extraordinary thinker and has been in, at the forefront in um, moving the whole conversation of public art and public space design um, forward in the field for a number of years <laughs> now. Um, but essentially, uh, the framework, which was just a visioning document, and again, there was no public policy in place for any kind of a percent for art program. There was no preservation uh, uh, mandates or ordinances in place in, at that time. No architectural design. Um, we were really very void of any kind of policy direction uh, at the city and state level, or excuse me, city and county level. So what the, it did was, to begin with, it set forth the idea of our predecessor agency, the Cultural, excuse me, the Cultural Arts Council, as being the regional agent, agency to advance public art and civic di design with public and private sector sectors through partnerships. For, so from the get-go, the idea is that this would be not a, um, a city hall initiative, but really a partnership-driven initiative with private sector, with business improvement districts, with universities, um, certainly with uh, the counties and the regions. So it was a big vision document. Um, uh, among the recommendations was the idea to create a percent for art pro program for the city of Houston or actually creating that mechanism to um, mandate 1.75% one of building construction monies. Also, uh, developer initiatives for the inclusion of design component and permit fees for arts funds, which already were in place with, uh, in cities like San Francisco and Los Angeles. So we had very successful models elsewhere in the country to look at. Next, please. The framework, this is very interesting. And I actually have a copy here. If anybody would like to look at it, we can make copies for you. Um, the framework focused on four areas. The bayous, freeway design, Main Street projects, 
that's actually, yes, untraditional venues like malls, shopping centers, schools, that kind of thing, and intersection improvement projects. So it was already based on that existing infrastructure here in Houston. You'll notice what it does not talk about is parks or public gathering spaces. Um, so it was using the existing platform of Houston already. Next, please. Fifteen years later, there's been a number of successes. We did, in fact, uh, have a Percent for Art program put in place. Um, we've completed well over 50 public art projects, both in the city center as well as throughout the city. Um, importantly, because of that, public art programs have been spawned at a number of the university campuses, including Rice, U of H, U of H Clear Lake, and U of, Lake, U of H Downtown. Private monies have been invested in, pub in public art projects. A number of the public art projects you're seeing in the city arise now are actually funded through um, private individuals or public, le uh, uh, public monies being leveraged with private monies. So that's, and I think that's a, um, unique to Houston. I am not aware of that in a lot of other cities. And temporary art projects have really been gaining steam over the last few years, and we're very excited about that, especially in some of these areas that were really identified a few years ago in the plan, along Buffalo Bayou, Braze Bayou, um, other non-traditional settings. Uh, next, please. Um, some of the lim limita limitations our percent for art program is tied to vertical construction, so not to infrastructure, not to streetscape, not to um, roadways, not to curbing, not, it's literally just building projects, which was really confined the way that we can use this money. Um, it is, has not been generated by uh, infrastructure building. Um, Policy through bond ordinance language, et cetera, have not allowed for public space enhancement in design. And our parks director joined us, um, Joe Turner, and this is an area that would so greatly enhance his public spaces, his parks, if we can change this language so that a lot more of this money can go to, into his parks and the highly concentrated public space where we really do gather in this city, not in our cars, but actually as pedestrians gathering as people. Um, no developer fees or mandates in, in, uh, are in place yet, um, as they are in a number of other large cities in the country. And we haven't been nearly successful in uh, park and other public space art and design elements really being advanced. So we've been successful in building objects and some very beautiful, important public art projects, but they have been objects. They haven't been really part of creating place. They've been attractions. Um, you, you all know both of these, go back please, you all know both of these uh, two relatively recent installations, one uh, Tolerance by Jaume Plenza, which was in fact privately funded along the bayou, and then Radiant Fountains by Dennis Oppenheim at JFK uh, near IAH. That was uh, city funds. Two really beautiful uh, destination pieces, iconic, they will be, become iconic pieces, but they are not part of a public space. Next, please. So moving forward, what we've decided to do is, um, through conversations like this, um, the city is a different place than it was 15 <coughs> years ago. Houstonians are very eager to have gathering places. Um, so we are working with the city right now to create a civic art master plan that will be submitted probably January, February to city council. Um, that will recommend a number of policy changes to allow us to use the monies in a more impactful way so that we are getting the monies into public spaces. For example, Mr. Turner's, Mr. Turner's parks, and so, and, and so many of us really do can gather in these parks. Back, please. 
Um, and we've changed our grants programs in the last few years to include different ways for civic art projects to be um, realized in neighborhoods uh, beyond just our traditional civic art program. This is um, a fantastic project we were able to launch uh, just a few months ago by two uh, well-known local artists. I'm sure everyone in the, know, in the room is familiar with Dan Hovell and Dean Ruck. They've been, been working for years here in this town. This is a piece uh, in Fifth Ward along Lyons Avenue. This was a grants program that we put in place uh, four years ago. It was a request, a request of Mayor Bill White. And he wanted us to put um, money into Hope Neighborhoods. And for those of you that don't, don't know, Hope Neighborhoods are a group of disadva disadva disadvantaged, excuse me, urban neighborhoods in the city. Um, but he wanted us to really infuse parts of those neighborhoods with destination pieces of contemporary art that responded to the community. So the challenge for the artists were contemporary artists, but working within the context of this community. So it was a grant program. Um, this is, do we have another slide of this, Santera? No, we don't. If you could go back. Um, they used, um, shotgun houses in the neighborhood that are actually going to be destroyed, move them to another site. They evolved from being houses like that on the left to actually being a stage that is now owned by the neighborhood. And if you haven't seen it, it's on Lyons Avenue, uh, right by the, the offices of the CDC, and it's a fabulous platform. And the community has really taken control of this platform and is going to program it themselves. We've actually turned it over to the neighborhood. So we're very excited about this project. This was a $50,000 project. Um, and I, I'm quite sure that these artists put much more than $50,000 into sweat into this project. Next. What we found with those artist, these artist neighborhood projects, though, is that it wasn't the best match because we were asking artists to go into neighborhoods to work with local leadership, but the local leadership were not necessarily equipped, equipped to provide project manager, or management or project oversight. Because it was a grants program from us, we didn't provide grants oversight at the beginning. So, um, we actually had some real challenges get the, getting these programs going. In the end, we actually did step in through our civic art team and provide a lot of oversight to get the, program, the projects in place. But what out, evolved out of that, we learned a lot of lessons. And so we've changed that grants program now to the Creative Economy Grant. This is a $100,000 grant now. So this is it's not a million dollar grant, but it's not an inconsequential amount of money. And the idea is that business improvement districts, universities, um, um, regional management districts, et cetera, uh, work with nonprofit organizations and or individual artists or design teams. Uh, so not just or artists, but architects, um, graphic designers, uh, et cetera, to infuse that additional level of artistry onto shovel-ready projects that they are already working on. So there needs to be a plan in place in the neighborhood that the artist or design team comes in with an additional layer to enhance the project that's already taking place. So an idea of that an example of that is actually, um, actually, next slide, please. Um, this is an example of this. This is not in Houston. This is a project that is in Pasadena, California. I, I had the opportunity to work on a few years ago. This is a neighborhood in the south side of Pasadena that was evolving out of an, a, a light industrial neighborhood into uh, the new campus for the Art Center College of Design. So that was over a, a period of about three years slated to become um, not just a campus for about 5,000 students, but also mixed-use retail living space. So 
we worked with the university, Department of State Department of Transportation, Planning Department of the City, Cultural Affairs, uh, Economic Development Office, uh, I believe that's it, um, and created a plan for this corridor, corridor called Innovation Corridor. And then we hired not just, not an artist, not a traditional artist, but we hired a man by the name of Nick Hoffermoss, who's based in Berlin, whose training is in fine arts, architecture, and graphic design, and has been running for a number of years a branding agency based in Berlin. So he looked at the entirety of the project, gave us a number of recommendations, and the first thing, this is an, just an example of the first thing that we worked on. These are these really, really beautiful um, industrial palm trees. So in response to that neighborhood on the south side of the city, it's the corridor coming up from downtown LA into Pasadena. Um, these are 60 foot tall steel palm trees with LED at the li uh, LED lights at the top. So not only did the palm trees sway, but then the LED lights move like this. So in the evening, it's just really, really beautiful to see these things as you're, as you're entering into the city. This is called the Innovation Corridor. So we were able to achieve this on a relatively small amount of money because Cultural Affairs was allowed to put the money forth in the design um, uh, and fabrication of the first round of these projects and then Transportation Department and some other stakeholders uh, adopted these things and we installed them over the, the next few years. So it, it's um, really become a, a beautiful landmark project uh, for the, the, the new south entrance into the city. Next please. That's the piece at night. Very magical. The other thing that uh, Carol asked me to talk about is our creative economy study because we have been in this agency we've been talking a lot about moving away from the idea of us being the uh, Department of Cultural Affairs or the local arts agency to support the, the nonprofit art sector to really the agency that is a catalytic partner for the larger creative sector to advance creative endeavor, endeavors throughout the city. The question is, how can we do that, walking the fine line between the, non, the traditional nonprofit sector and keeping the nonprofit sector engaged and feeling like we are still supportive of that while investing in the for-profit creative sector. So it's been a very interesting um, walk over the last few years. Um, so creative economy study that we've been working on for a few years and um, we actually went through round one of this, this study about two years ago and we just frankly were not happy with the findings. The findings were um, that about 250,000 people in Houston work in the creative economy sectors. Well that's huge. For those of you who remember the economic impact study of a few years ago, 15,000 people uh, many of us in this room are employed in the nonprofit arts. Well, that's a reasonable amount of money, but when you're talking to business leadership and especially the Greater Houston Partnership, that's nothing in comparison to medical, education, construction, the other big traditional in industries they, they work with. But when we could say 250,000 people work in the creative sector, they are highly educated, they have high incomes, they're invested in their community, they own property, et cetera, et cetera. Suddenly, the leadership of the Greater Houston Partnership was interested in this information and started to see it as a valuable sector in the city. So we started with this first study. We decided we need to step back and do an additional round of, of uh, data gathering. So we hired a firm out of uh, Denver and we've done a new round of data collecting based on studies in Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Miami, Denver, and Portland uh, uh, to 
put us in the, in the national perspective. And we're very eager to, to announce those findings. I can tell you a few of the findings right now. We're for, formally launching in February-ish. But again, the, the reason for doing this was measuring the size and significance of the for-profit and non-profit sectors together. So catapulting us from 15,000 to 200,000 uh, professional jobs. We looked at filming, gaming, advertising, graphic design, fashion, architecture, publishing, lighting design, etc. cetera. Uh, again, nearly the size of construction. Next, please. We wanted to, we did this because we wanted to highlight the raise and raise the importance of the creative workers inside Houston to raise the, vis the visibility of our impact inside creative organizations, but also inside traditional organizations that have to have creatives, creatives working inside those organizations. Um, secondly, because we all know, most of us in this, this room know that um, the, creatives, the creatives themselves really don't look at this for-profit, non-profit line anymore. They go where the interesting projects are. So whether it's with a major corporation that's doing some kind of uh, research or working for uh, Houston Grand Opera or doing a community-based project. If it's an interesting project and it fits their skill set, they're gonna go do the work. So they don't see this um, wall between for-profit and non-profit. We felt like we needed to start advancing the conversation to recognizing that that old paradigm really doesn't work anymore. Thirdly, we wanted to um, advance, um, well, also recognize the fact that the two sectors are intertwined. Nonprofit of, oftentimes is the R&D for the for-profit. The for-profit, however, has resources that the nonprofit does. So it's only beneficial for our creatives to move back and forth between these two sectors. Next, please. Very, very, very importantly, uh, and this is a real challenge over the next few months, um, traditional businesses in this town, as most of us know, are very s focused on the fact that um, the arts are a very important quality of life, and it's an, a way to attract um, high-level professionals to this city, but they have never put their hands around the fact that it's a huge economic engine that has to be recognized and has to be invested in. Because again, as everyone in this room knows, what happens is we attract creatives to this city. They don't have access to venture capital here in the way that they do in other cities, especially right up the street in Austin. Um, so they go to these other cities because they can get more backing for their projects. So we need to make the argument here that business needs to be investing in um, our creative endeavors here. So, that's really an overview of where we are with the project. Well, um, you know, uh, we met, uh, I think a week ago, uh, <laughs> Jason and Carol and I in my office, and I, I had so many questions about what this was about. Uh, I really did not know, to be honest with you, uh, and I didn't even know what questions to ask, but I must say, I've got so many questions now uh, that I, can't, I don't think I'm gonna be able to get them all out. But uh, one of the things we talked about was, as an architect, uh, many times we work with uh, one client, one piece of land, and we create this one object. So we have a, 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 a micro uh, viewpoint sometimes. It's hard for some of us to stand back, unless we work in the urban design uh, community. And so one of the challenges I think I talked to Carol about was uh, some of us have to really take a step back away from that one client, away from that piece of land and think, holistically and think more of in a macro standpoint. For some of you in landscape architecture and urban design, it's, it's a lot easier to do. Uh, we're working on a project now in Fifth Ward. We're restoring the historic deluxe theater on Lyons Avenue. And there's been so much conversation around that project about 
uh, you know, so, some people think it's going to be a change project. Maurice talked about change. Some people really question whether it's going to have any impact on the community. And so this is really interesting to me because I've been a part of those conversations. Um, I'd really like to know, and maybe Maurice, you can talk about this later. You talked about change. I'd like to know what is that perfect community? What, what is the ultimate goal that we want to achieve with placemaking? Um, is there an example of it? How was it done? Uh, for me, that would kind of close the gap uh, to understand. And it, it may be a different answer depending on the community, depending on the place, depending on the person. But um, that's, you know, we, the last 10 or 20 years have been a lot about gentr gentrification. Uh, that's a trend. Uh, what is the trend now? What is going to be the trend 10 years from now? I, I'd like to understand a lot about that. Uh, Jonathan talked a lot about the economy. I had that question. I think that question has been answered. Uh, but I, I still would like to know where is the money coming from, uh, truly. Uh, we, we did the uh, African American Library at the Gregory School, and I remember seeing the line item for art, and I said, what is that going to do? Uh, that's not enough money to really do anything. And so uh, it, that question still sits in my head. Uh, where is the money coming from to create these coalitions? Uh, and then the, lastly, uh, why wow, it would be great if we had an architect as a mayor. Uh, <laughs> I, I just, you know, you talk, Camillo's on the AIA board with me, and uh, we, we talked about public architects and public designers and policy makers, and we had one run for city council this year, which was great. Uh, uh, it's, it's a much easier thing to do when you have designers and leadership, but without those designers and leadership, I, it's, a, it's a whole nother thing, uh, because Can we- take this in the audience? <laughs> 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 so uh, those are some of the things that just stand out in my mind, and we can talk about those things. I'm sure other people have questions, uh, and I don't know if you, anyone wants to talk to that now before I pass it over to to. Uh, I'd like to hear from our other two uh, guests, just reflections that they've had on the information, and then I'm sure there's a question or in within all of that that we can put together. So. Okay, Where's well. Where's the money? <laughs> <laughs> Not in this seat, let's start there. Um, uh, but just a little bit about um, kind of the organization that I, I represent, uh, uh, historically underserved. Uh, we were a product of kind of the urban to suburban flight uh, several decades ago. And so when, when we look at these wonderful things and, and want to do projects like this, I've got to convince these smaller business owners, the kind of mom and pops, if you will, that I can take their dollars that they've been in, in that I'm going to assess them and say, we need these uh, projects. And um, some very specific arguments that I could use to convince them to say, look, this is just as important as public safety in the sense that we're going to bring in more customers. You're going to grow your client base to, to, so that you can grow your business. And, and that's kind of the crux of where I am when you start talking about where does the money come from because the money that we get, I still, just like the other politicians, I have to answer to these business owners that I assess. So I, I, that's kind of my first question in, in, um, in, in kind of where you do that, but kind of on a grander scale, and we can talk about this now or afterwards, when um, in, in your presentation, you kind of that public investment starts and then that private money follows. When you are in a city as wonderful as ours that does not have zoning, when you want to make these huge uh, kind of public investments, what types of things do you recommend that says, okay, well, yes, you can build anything you want, but we want you to build this. So I, I will leave it at that. Well, I, I guess my question would be for the both of you, I mean, because you're in a fairly friendly environment here now, but. How do you make the argument to unfriendly audiences? <laughs> you know, um, you know we, we talk among ourselves about the importance of art and community development and 
placemaking and that kind of stuff. But you know, we're talking, to, we're talking among our friends, and we all agree, we all come from the same place, but when you're out there talking about the money, it comes from somewhere else. So how do you make that argument? I mean, I think it's, uh, I think it's a, a, key, um, a key issue. I mean, and this is the issue um, around designing, uh, proposing projects um, that embody the values of the community that you're talking about versus, <clears throat> I would argue, imposing one's artistic vision on a community. And a lot of times we're talking about projects that are a singular artistic vision and we're trying to convince the public that they really should value this because it's art or it's beauty. And I think that that um, sets us up for um, failure, uh, quite frankly, uh, because there are many communities that have uh, far more essential needs um, than to, to, to look at something that's uh, an inert um, object, however beauty, beautiful it might be. So I think it only, I mean, I think it's, uh, and I, I, we have public art programs much like this one um, that you drive by, um, and uh, I think it all contributes to people starting to see uh, its value and perhaps uh, not be intimidated by it, by it. But it's really just the start. <laughs> it's just the beginning. Uh, and, and I think, you know, Houston, it seems like you've been doing it for about 15 years. So people have now come to accept that this is an arts community. I think that's a good foundation. Um, but I can tell you the projects that I've um, seen that have really gotten the merchants excited were the projects um, that brought foot, foot soldiers in front of their stores, uh, that increased pedestrian activity, that got people out of their cars and on their feet and passing by their shops. So I, I purposefully tried to show projects that are not empty, <laughs> but are used. Uh, and there are hundreds, in some cases thousands, of people who are uh, visiting these sites not because of the singularity of the art, but because of the power of the place that's being made. Uh, and I think, um, so it, it, it just kind of responds to their bottom line. They need folks to see their businesses. So the more congestion, pedestrian congestion, people congestion we can create, um, the more successful and supportive they're going to be. So you would say their value is I want congestion. I want people on foot passing by the business. I want them lingering. I want them to be in a place that's shaded so that they might actually dine outdoors. And those are places. They're not, and I think the art is uh, simply a, a contributor or an enabler uh, of it. So we constantly deal with uh, audiences that are, um, uh, that need, um, need their values somehow reflected in the things that we do. And I'm not talking about dumbing down, I'm talking about inspiring up to people. When you talk about people's values, they know that that's not trivial, that's something kind of serious. And they can share with you incredible fantasies. And what, I, what I've often enjoyed is what an artist brings to the conversation, the way I enjoy what an architect or a designer brings to a conversation we really have a, a slightly different point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, and it animates and enlivens and helps, I think, people who are not accustomed to expressing themselves in this way, uh, giving them free license to. Um, so for me, that's, that's how I approach it. Yeah. And, and, well, maybe, uh, Jonathan, wait, let me, let me say this, though. let me tell this little story, though, because I, hmm. I want to, I, I, I you, you hit up on it, but there's a little Go bit for more, Go for right? It. Go okay. For it. I'll give you an example of where the question comes from, right? I do a lot of little talks or lectures or whatever, different places, and one day I just thought, I was bored with talking about art, and so I decided I would do a presentation about the work that I do in different places as a businessman. Mm -hmm. And so I set out to do this lecture without mentioning the word art, <laughs> artists, architecture, design, mm -hmm. anything and just talk strictly about real estate, how much, you know, how much I've done in Houston, what's the real estate of the thing in Korea, what was the, you know, blah, 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 you know, and just 
try to do that just as a practice, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes, you know, particularly when you're talking about, you know, people that are potential financiers, mm -hmm. you just never know when as soon as the word art comes out, everything shuts down. <laughs> right. You know, right. and so the longer you can keep the, the term out, the longer you can keep them on the hook. As a friend of mine, Mel Chen, is so always a great artist from Houston. He operates in covert mode when he's operating in those rims. You know, never let them know what they're getting. You know, so how do you yeah. how do you do that? How do we talk without talking about art? <laughs> Basically, well, you know, a lot of my time is talking with elected officials. And of course there's conversation about building community, um, building density, uh, creating different new community, uh, attracting new different communities to um, your district, uh, your ward, what have you. But um, I think it's interesting you're saying that, Rick, because I, I actually, don't shy away from using those words. What I do talk about is I constantly use things like catalytic. That by putting this here, it's going to do this, it's going to do this, and it's going to do that. So that they start to see the vision of how this can all, it is in, all interrelated. And that investing in $20,000 of their operating funds in a series of five benches that are artists made really will excite those um, business owners along that street and maybe get them to invest in the street front program that the development office has not been able to get them interested in in the last few years. Um, and they seem to respond better to that. I have to say, even though this is not um, the most cohesive city, uh, aesthetically cohesive city, um, there's a real, uh, I've, I've only been here five years, so I don't have the history of some of the gentlemen on the, on the panel, but I, there's a real interest uh, with the elected officials right now to figure out how to do this. There's a, an enthusiasm that you probably didn't have 15 years ago when you were doing some of your work. So, yeah, and also I think, I think uh, increasingly um, cities have shown us how to take the most mundane utilitarian parts of the public infrastructure and um, raise the bar on uh, excellence. Uh, and New York City is a case in point. Um, if you're doing um, a great on the street, um, it is competitively bid, and they will say it has to have a landscape architect and an, and an artist. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so you, you see these incredible public works. It reminds me a little bit of the swaying uh, lampposts. Um, there's a way to embed this into city policy, and I think it has to become a kind of norm. Uh, and that, too, creates uh, demand for artists, uh, and artists that have to negotiate you know, the bureaucracies as well, and uh, leads to, I think, um, kind of, uh, if you say, infiltrate uh, the systems that deliver things that are in the public realm. Uh, I think you have to do that. I think that's a next step, and I certainly saw it in your, your points of recommendation. Um, but the uh, city of New York uh, has been incredibly successful, and this has only happened in the past 10 years, mm -hmm. uh, as they've started to see that investment in the public realm, um, raising the bar on excellence, is paying back enormous dividends, um, like the High Line uh, that everyone, I'm sure, knows. Um, but that's a project that could have never happened without the grassroots, grassroots activism. Um, city planners figuring out how to transfer development rights, uh, a national design competition, bringing designers and landscape architects together. Uh, and the uh, uh, result, apart from being a beautiful and unique singular uh, structure, this park in the sky, uh, has been a multi-billion dollar real estate boom. Mm -hmm. They are now, the simple act of transferring development rights into the neighborhood, they consciously understood that they were seeding economic development opportunities throughout. And now they'll have a museum uh, 
Renzo Piano was doing in the Whitney Museum. And this is all because somebody understood that uh, an old rusty elevated rail was a value of that community. And it was someone, it could have been anyone in this room, uh, when they heard that it was going to be torn down, said, oh no. And they began advocating for it. And so I think that every city has their high line. And we may not be an elevated rail in the sky. It might be some dilapidated industrial building. It might be a brownfield. Um, but I think we have those projects. And the reason why it succeeded is because it spoke to the values of that particular neighborhood. So I, I kind of return to that notion that we, if we play on their field, so say, well, what is important to you? and trust our own artistic and creative abilities to take it and elevate it and interpret it into something extraordinary, I think you'll see, um, I think you'll see public art and place making all over the place. I, I was actually gonna ask uh, what is the, I've asked what the perfect scenario is in terms of collaboration between art and economy and business. And so you've kind of answered that question. I think a lot of, I love City Center here in Houston, I, it, I, to me it works. Uh, there's not much else like it. I don't know if everybody feels the way I do, but it, it works. Uh, and it's, it's, but it's, it's, it's really the only place in Houston like that, uh, to me. I mean, there's, other, there's Discovery Green, there's other places that work also, uh, but. You definitely need some successes. And I think. The you need a benchmark. Yeah, well, you need, you need something that works. <laughs> Right. Uh, so then you can try to replicate it where people uh, develop a habit. Right. They, 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 they can figure out that it works as well. You develop a culture. And they start to want more of it. Right. Uh, and demand that in other places that are not necessarily in the, right. the city center. I think Carol wants to take it out to the audience, right? And I, see, I do see a hand here. Uh, uh, I want to pass the mic around here. I'll bring it out. I heard you talking about having a conversation. Okay, the, the thought that I have is that I think the idea of having a rep stream is important and picking up on the idea. I think it would be neat if, like, when we do flood control, that there is money set aside for more than moving the water fast. And that could be, a lot of it could be trails and things like that. But I remember when Jonathan was talking about the various bridges he's seen, one of the neatest things I've seen is, is a visit to Longwood Park in Pennsylvania, Longwood Gardens. There you see water going down stair steps, you see water in fountains. In Houston, except for the water wall, what we see is water running through a concrete line ditch there's no reason we couldn't have stair steps, we couldn't have fountains, we couldn't have water spouting over the bridges that cross them. And I think something like that, I mean, Houston is unique in that it has all these rivers running through it, the bayous. There are a lot of drainage ditches. There are places that people see, the kids walk along to go to school. And, you know, you're, you're talking some about, you know, architecture, and there's a lot of architecture people, but why don't you think about the water in Houston and what you could do with a small amount of money. I mean, you could put like a, a water wheel in one of the drainage things that lit, lit a light or something. I mean, you could do lots of different things and you could make the bayous, which now are neat places for people to walk along and run along, that they could stop for a minute and look. I mean, like another example, I've, there was a drainage ditch that runs for five miles it was as wide, a third as wide as Bray's Bayou. There were 10 trees in that five miles. So I got flood control to plant trees along there. We're gonna to try to get them to put wildflowers. There, it would be neat if we could have your know, art along that too that people could look at. So, you know, think about that sort of thing, but think about, I mean, you know, I don't think it could happen quickly, but flood control projects like that. There could be a, something like the arts tax, but I would suggest you connect it with a trail, you know, public usage thing, so you could pay for trails, but also pay for art. Hey, what you're basically saying is let's solve multiple problems at, at once and just use art as a, as a component to solve it. And I think the more and more we graft 
uh, artistic, creative expression onto every utilitarian need we have, um, the more you're going to see art flourish. So I think if it's water here that's an issue, that's a source of money. If it's, if it's infrastructure um, in streets, it's another. I was most intrigued by your, your uh, identifying that if we could get um, a percentage for art uh, invested in the horizontal, all of that translates into public space. Uh, and so you, you grab hold, you just change the equation instead of dressing up buildings uh, with art. You literally have to start to deal with the shape and the form of places and spaces and the surfaces that we walk, uh, we walk on. So I think that one is key uh, and tapping into the infrastructure dollars, whether it be water or roads or other utilities. Yeah, think, think about the water wall by Transco Tower, where used to be Transco Tower. That's a, that's a, yeah. Cooling water tower, which you see in refineries, which are one of the least attractive things around. But now people go when they want to get married, go, go around that water. I mean, you know, you can do neat things with it. <laughs> Um, coming at it from the legal perspective, I would say in answer to your question about how do you get hard business folks interested in investing in public art and civic spaces. Um, I guess my, my approach would be to approach it like preparing a case. Um, you give hard evidence, provide hard evidence for, um, that would support your argument in favor of why investing in public art um, helps merchants. And, and it sounds like there is um, there's a study that's arising within the city but it might, might be also helpful to cite to other places. For example, it sounds like from your remarks that Austin has been remarkably successful, perhaps, in, um, in, in, in um, being competitive with Houston in the sense of taking monies that could be very well invested in Houston, but they've, they've gone to Austin because they are more competitive. So if there are examples that show that, there's nothing, there's nothing to dispute that, and that's something to me that would convince a hard business person. The other thing is zoning. I think the lack of zoning um, has a big effect in Houston. It presents a lot of opportunity, ironically, because there's not much legal regulation in the way of, of what, can, what can a civic space be. Yeah, I have two, thank you, I have two comments on that. One is, um, it, you know, there's two thoughts on this as far as the zoning and whether or not that's an opportunity or not. We also know that part of the reason why Midtown has not evolved more quickly is because there, the way that there is lack of zoning there, so the price of property is so high that the developers are sitting on it. If it would have, if zoning would have been put in place, local zoning, district zoning would have been put in place so it didn't allow for 50-foot towers to be built, then um, the developers would have been more, more willing to, to build 12-story buildings that were creative-focused, and I think Midtown would be tenfold um, um, more advanced than it is now. So one comment on that. Just one thing, you know, the argument from law professors in support of zoning is that it, it doesn't have the um, effect at all on the market. It decreases prices. Um, that's that's the, the argument that many law professors yeah. in support of, of our doing <coughs> yeah. things. Yeah. I mean, again, it's such an odd uh, situation. You, got, <clears throat> you all have to deal with it. <laughs> uh, it's home for you. But uh, we actually found that um, zoning um, gave property owners a sense of uh, predictability mm -hmm. of what is going to be the future of the area in which they're in. So people actually were um, more readily willing to invest in their property if they knew that something next door wasn't gonna come and depreciate its value. And that might be, some people might think having a, you know, a 20 story tower next to their building is depreciating it. But it was the predictability that zoning gave them that spurred 
um, reinvestment um, in the properties. So I, I would think that it gives, it gives the, the investor insurance and not the other way around. Well, if I could just make one comment about that and what I've noticed kind of in our area, um, when, when you don't have zoning, then you get kind of a, a real bad speculation. Mm -hmm. And when that price jumps, and we've seen properties go from $25 a square foot to $50 a square foot overnight, what that means to an investor is, well, in order for me to make money on this particular project, I have to do a 50 story building because otherwise it doesn't it's not advantageous for me to invest in that and that's another issue that you have when you're doing zoning versus not zoning because with the zoning you can say well you can charge fifty dollars a square foot for it but nobody's going to pay it because in order to make your money you can't build what you need to do so the the i would argue that the price does kind of come down a little bit when you're having a zoning type of situation if i could add one one other thing to that um, one of the early recommendations coming out of the framework that has been realized in other cities, more so in the, in the West, but um, certainly in LA, San Francisco, Seattle, I believe Dallas has it, and New York has it, um, and, and a myriad of smaller cities. Um, but the private developer fee, um, be it a permit fee or a, a percent fee of construction cost fee or what have you, um, the amount of money that is generated to enhance infrastructure from an artistic perspective is unbelievable. The Museum of Contemporary Art in downtown Los Angeles was built, the shell of that was built 100% by the um, building of the Wells Fargo high rise a block away. And that was their percent for our mandate, building that museum. So we can, we can really advance our cultural infra infrastructure in this city, being, being facilities, organizations, art schools, or just public space tremendously if there was just a little bit of attack on the developers. Okay, it's eight o'clock now and we have one more you question. Um, and what I'm suggesting, because we don't want to hold you guys, uh, but if you could ask the question, have some answers, and then we close down and whoever wants to stay can stay until what time? They put your closing time? About 15, 20 minutes afterwards. Okay, so officially after this one, anybody who wants to go, uh, we can uh, close off the program. Thank you, so no pressure, but it'd be good. It's the last comment. Um, it's just a brief comment I would like to add to the conversation, which I truly enjoyed, and thanks for sharing uh, all your stories. Uh, I've been to Charlottesville many times, and it's truly a great place. And I believe that Houston has many Charlottesvilles. My point is, I think, the creative community of Houston, the artists, the architects, the planners, and others, can raise the volume on how we communicate our story. I think you see the Houston Press, you see other channels that we are used with a press release to tell about singular projects, but I think we can perhaps think about how can we place a permanent voice in the press, in the paper, in the TV channels, so it's not just a one event single story that you tell to the public, because I think the public is ready. And if you have a consistent message that Houston is an arts community, and it's, and it's not just case by case. So that's just a seed I like to plant in the conversation. Any comments? You would be great on city council. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think um, clearly, um, <clears throat> An organized voice is more powerful than a singular, singular voice. So um, inevitably, you have um, alliances, you have professional organizations here um, that I think you're encouraging them to become public in their expressions of um, you know, expressions about the built and natural environment. Um, it, it, one of the challenges is, uh, you know, historically, you know, designers, because we uh, are invested in the private sector, um, um, often are not willing to speak truth 
to power and call something ugly when it's ugly or something um, that is uh, mediocre or not, um, not enhancing the city. We just kind of sit and we tend to complain. Um, but I actually think that um, every venue that actually has a legitimate um, authority to speak about the pu public matters of design, that there should be designers on every single one of those commissions, every single one of those task force. Um, that's where we develop our voice and we have a legitimate claim. And that's what I figured that out after two years of trying to be the lone spokesperson about design in our city. And I uh, was constantly getting <laughs> beat up and silenced. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to call my friends. And I started challenging my landscape friends, my preservation friends, my planners to, to join these boards and commissions. And many of them had uh, never even thought about that as a possible venue. Uh, and that's when the conversation changed, because all of a sudden we were the conversation. We were um, facilitating the public's discussion and bringing uh, our level of expertise. And then we found ordinary citizens were learning what we were talking about and they were patterning. They were just as good as we were in expressing these ideas. And that's when I started to see a culture, a design culture change. And I, I think that could happen, clearly it could happen in Houston because you have a very robust professional creative community. Uh, and if they ever dare to start to infiltrate these um, venues, uh, I think you'd see the change you're, you're hoping for. Well, can we thank everyone for the conversation?